Well, hello and welcome to today's training webinar. This is Church 360 Ledger, and we'll be looking at reconciliation and reports. My name is Peter Frank. I am the Senior Manager of Marketing Technology here at Concordia Technology Solutions, which is part of Concordia Publishing House. I've been involved with the Ledger team since the very beginning. My first day with CTS, I got to see the initial structure of Church 360 Ledger just as they were beginning to program it. They were building out all of their testing tools to make sure that everything always balanced. You can reach me at my email that's on the screen, peter.frank at cph.org. Now this is the third in a series of three training sessions. So we've looked at cash basis accounting basics and account setup. We did that on Monday or session one. Yesterday we flew through transactions and other daily tasks. Typically I go longer with that and we went pretty short yesterday and I realized there's a couple things that I skipped and I didn't have really well outlined for me. So we're gonna to touch on those right at the beginning and I think that'll provide a good basis for today anyways. So, you know, it worked out quite well, if you ask me. And then today we are looking at reconciliation and reports. Now yesterday was the daily things, so the things that you'll do as soon as they come up. You know, you, you process a transaction right after the transaction occurs. Well, today we're looking at the things that happen a little less frequently. You know, not the once a year kind of stuff like budgeting, but the once a month kind of things like reconciliation or pulling reports for your next church council meeting, anything like that few housekeeping items before we get too far. I'm planning 75 minutes for presentation. I'm hoping to land right around then, if not a little bit short, just to provide some time for Q&A. The 15 minutes at the end will be reserved for Q&A, and that can be anything about Church 360 Ledger, anything that we've covered so far. Typically, I only ask, answer questions referring to the things that were shown in the presentation today. But since this is our last session, I want to make sure you get all of your questions answered. So we will be, uh, it'll be free game there. Anybody can ask a question that relates to anything within Church 360 Ledger, and I'll do my best to answer it. We are recording this webinar. I'll be sharing this webinar with you tomorrow morning. It'll be going into our resource center and that can be available for you to rewatch at any time. You can also share it with other people in your congregation who might benefit from watching it. All attendees are muted during this webinar and that's not because we don't wanna hear from you. It's just because we have so many people attending that we'd be talking over ourselves if we unmuted everyone. So you shouldn't hear anybody else but me during this pre presentation. And if you do, that's uh, completely unintentional. Now I will warn you, we have some work going on in our building right outside my office. Our facility team is hard at work replacing ceiling tiles and lights and everything. So you might hear something from them, but they have been phenomenally quiet during this whole presentation time frame this week. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. Finally, I do want you to ask questions throughout. Sometimes when I'm presenting, something will pop into your head that's not related to what I'm talking about, but you want to make sure to ask it. Well, there's no need to wait. We've got a question queue that will um, continually add questions. The most recent ones always show up. And so there's no reason to wait to ask it during, uh, until the Q&A time. Ask it when you think about it. If we can answer it during the chat, Jordan will be happy to provide an answer. Otherwise, we'll answer it during the Q&A time. I always make a few assumptions about everybody who attends, and that just helps me get into the right frame of mind. It helps you know what I was thinking as I prepared this presentation. So the first thing is, I'm assuming you're a brand new user of Church 360 Ledger. Now, if you've attended this week, I would consider you more of an advanced user at this point, or at least intermediary or intermediate, but I start off with that understanding that you don't really know anything at all, because that helps me cover all the details. I'm also assuming you have full access to all the features. If you don't, you may not be able to do the things I'm showing today. And that's okay, it's up to you and your church what you should have access to. But the presentation will assume that you have access to everything. I'm also assuming you're not an accountant. I am not an accountant, I am a marketer, as you can see. I'm here um, doing marketing type of things by training you to help use our software better so that you can be advocates for it. So I won't be using a lot of accounting terms. And if you are an accountant, great, that's fantastic. I may not understand all your questions just because I'm not at that level, but I do understand the software and that's why I'm here today. And I hope to train you on the software, not train you to be an accountant. 
Finally, I'm assuming you attended the first two sessions of this training series. There's gonna be a number of things that we kind of gloss over because I already covered it over the last two sessions. That doesn't mean that it's not important. That doesn't mean I expect you to not know what it is. I actually expect you to know what those things are because I've already presented on them. But you'll still get a lot of value if you didn't attend those first two sessions. The training goal for today, I always like to have a training goal by the end of the day, you will know how to complete a reconciliation and generate each report that's in the software. So our outline is to start talking about the date selector. That's kind of a weird thing. I wanted to make sure we talked about that, but it becomes especially important as we get into reconciliation and reporting because it's all tied to your date selector. So we'll talk about that. I'm actually going to start with a quick review from yesterday. I probably should have put that on the outline, but a very quick review. Then we'll get into the date selector. From there, we'll get into reconciling accounts, that month-end process where you take your bank statement and you look at what's in Church 360 Ledger and you make sure it all matches. Then we'll get into the reports. And there's a number of different reports. They're very standard financial reports, the general ledger report, income and expense, chart of accounts, balance sheet, and also the event log, which isn't really a report. It's not something you print out and hand to people, but it's a good reporting tool where you can go see what's happening in your account. If you have not already started a free trial, I don't know why you haven't, especially if you've been here the first two days, but I highly encourage you to start a free trial, log in, get comfortable with the software. It's going to help you follow along. Let's go ahead and log in. I will switch my screen over, there we go. Now, this is the home screen and I have it zoomed in quite a bit. You can zoom in as well when you're in Ledger by hitting the control button and the plus on your keyboard. That works with most browsers. That is not a Ledger function, that is a browser function. But I do that during this presentation so that you can see it better. It is a little bit too big for my preferences, but that's okay. So. Just wanted to clarify that if yours doesn't look this large, it's because you may not be zoomed in, but you can zoom in just like I do. Now, yesterday we covered transactions, and there was one thing that we talked about that I didn't go into great detail on, and that, that is when you are paying for something with a liability account, then you need to pay off that liability account at some point in time. So the example that we went through yesterday I go down here is right here we're using my company Concordia Publishing House as the example we offer house accounts for churches where you can purchase something and be invoiced for it pay for it 30 days later well in this case that's what we did with our VBS starter kit where the payee is Concordia Publishing House we put it on our house account which is a liability meaning that we owe CPH the $140 or whatever it ends up being with shipping and all that. And so it becomes an expense at that time, but now we have that liability to pay off. Well, let me show you what we can do. And I'm doing this partially to review and partially just to add some transactions to our checking account so that we can reconcile today. The next thing I'll go to uh, there in order to pay off the liability, let me show you where that is. If we click on liabilities, Go to CPH house account. We started with an initial balance of $110, and then we put this $140. So we bought something else from CPH last month, and it's still on our account. Well, I'm gonna go and do a new transaction and do a payment. Let's say we're paying for this online. And the memo is to pay off CPH house account. We'll do that as of today. So the payee is Concordia Publishing House. The asset is where we're going to start. This is what you're paying from. So last time when we did it on the house account, we were paying from a liability, meaning we're going to owe this money still. Well, now we're paying from our checking account, and we're going to pay it out of the VBS checking account, which is a restricted fund as part of our overall checking account. So you see these two lines here are both the same bank account but they are separate accounts and our chart of accounts. So we're gonna pay out of the VBS restricted fund. We're gonna pay $250 on that. Actually, that's probably not even right. We're gonna pay $140 for VBS and then the unrestricted, the same bank account, 
we'll get $110 taken out. So while we're splitting this transaction, it's actually $250 out of the one bank account. So that's all the bank is gonna know is the 250. And that'll become important when we get into reconciliation. So now we say, what are we paying this to? Well, we already had the expense account hit last time with that transaction. So this time we're paying to the liability account, to the CPH house account. And so it's a split transaction, but just like any good transaction, it balances at the end. It wouldn't be a good transaction. We wouldn't be able to process it if it didn't balance. So we're debiting the CPH house account. We're crediting the asset accounts, our checking account. I hope that makes sense. And you know, this is a little bit of a review, but it's gonna come into play with some new functionality we have on reconciliation. So we'll go ahead and click save. And now you'll see that our liability count is at zero. And that is a very good place for liability counts to be. You don't wanna to owe too much money as a church or as an individual. No one really wants to owe anyone money. So we've paid off that account. Now, if we go back to home, we'll see there it is, there's our payment. And that came out of our asset account under banks and American bank and our checking account but it came out of each one of these sub accounts. Now, if you remember, we talked on day one about chart of accounts and the chart of account allows you to add a restricted fund like VBS to any sort of asset account. Then as soon as you add a restricted fund, you get an unrestricted fund, just one unrestricted fund for bank accounts. So you can have as many restricted funds as you need. You'll only ever have one unrestricted but all of those combined equal your checking account. And that's what we have right here. So you see how these transactions are on there, including this one that was just split. Now remember, this was one transaction. It was for $250 and that's all that the bank knows. So the first thing we're gonna talk about before we get into reconciliation is the date selector. And this is pretty straightforward, but it's gonna influence reconciliation. So if you go up to the top right on the one to third row, you know, the, on, in the white, but at the top of the white, there is a date selector on the far right corner. This date selector is tied to your chart of accounts, sorry, tied to your books, tied to your fiscal year. And it's looking at when your fiscal year starts and ends. Well, we set it up so that it was tied in at the beginning of the year. Um, so we've got quarter four, sorry, beginning of the fiscal year was a non-calendar fiscal year. We've got quarter four, that is one um, July, or sorry, January 1st, 2021. So we actually wanna go back to quarter one, which is April one through June. So I had some issues setting up my uh, fiscal year, but that's how it works out. These quarters are tied to your at the start of your fiscal year. So the first three months are quarter one, the next three months are quarter two. Regardless of um, what the calendar year is, it's when your fiscal year starts. Now below that, you have months, and that is actual months. So if I'm wanting to look at May, it's always gonna be the May of this fiscal year. And if I look at June, it's this fiscal year. If I go to July, it continues on. But if I go back to March, all of a sudden that's in 2021. So just keep that in mind. We put them in that order because it's easy to find, but it's based on the May of this fiscal year. Now, as you update these dates, you can see the date range in this last section. This date range can also be used to filter down your transactions. So maybe you only wanna do two months, well, actually we started it at May 1st. So if we do just May 1st, we could always go to like May 1st to June 30th and have that kind of date range in place. See that? We've done one transaction for the future. You typically don't do that, but I was doing it for demonstration purposes. Now we have some initial balances here and I already reconciled those because that's a one-time thing. And I'm gonna not use those as part of my example today because Typically, you're starting off with the balance. Unless it's a brand new bank account, you're gonna have that balance there. So when you go to reconcile, that whole process is all about taking your bank statement, seeing what actually happened in the bank, 
and then seeing what you say happened in Church 360 Ledger. And you reconcile the two, meaning the bank is the source of truth. Your ledger reflects how you want to track this. Well, this can be a much more difficult task than I'm going to show you today because I only have a handful of transactions. And depending on how active your church is, your bank statement may be three, four, five, six, seven pages per month of different transactions. So I don't want to pretend like this is as simple as I'm showing you. I'm using a very simple example to teach you how the process works, not because I think it's gonna be that simple every day or every month at your church. Let's go ahead and take a look at where we start. If you see a green reconcile button, just like I have here in the middle of the screen, then that means you can reconcile your account. That means it's an actual asset account. You see, when I go click on unrestricted, I'm actually one step farther down from an account level. This is just the way I'm splitting it at my church here, rather than how the bank is splitting it. And if I go back one step to American Bank, this is just a category. There's multiple accounts under there. So that's a clear thing to get in your mind of what is an account versus what is, what is a bank account versus what is an account in my chart of accounts. So if you see reconcile, that means that it's an asset account, not a category, not a restricted fund. When I click on reconcile, it takes me into a very different mode. Uh, we like to joke that this is the Hulk mode. All of a sudden it turns green. Well, that's just to identify that you are no longer in your account view. You are in that reconcile mode. Now you'll see that right up at the top here, reconcile. But when you scroll down, these this section looks just like your regular account view. So it's very easy to confuse those two if it wasn't completely green. That's why we have that there. Well, let me walk through the process. If you've ever balanced your checking account at home, you probably followed a similar process where you have a bank statement, you go back to where you track the different checks and you go and literally check them off saying, okay, this one's there, this one's there, this one's there. Oh, somebody hasn't cashed a check yet. Well, I'm gonna leave this unchecked because that'll show up next month if they hopefully cash it. So the statement here, this section, is supposed to reflect what your physical bank statement, or maybe it's a PDF, but what your bank statement shows. The first thing you're gonna do is select the statement date. Now this is where the date selector comes into play. Not this date selector, but the other date selector. Remember, we did just May and June. Well, your initial state of this view is going to be based on your date selector. So if I go, I'm gonna hit cancel. If I go back here and say May 1st, through May 15th, for one, I'm gonna hide a number of things here. And then when I go and reconcile, I'm not gonna see anything because it's already filtered down by the date selector. Doesn't matter what the statement date says. The statement date is what your bank statement says. However, if you are going outside of that, so like what we were at before, June 30th, while this view goes wider, if I go to reconcile, it still filters it down by anything on or before May 20th. Well, this is where it can get a little bit confusing. And if you think about your bank statement, you're gonna get it and the dates that are gonna be on it are gonna be your transactions that processed. Well, as long as you put the date as the date of the transaction, you'll be okay. Because if you did something on, let's say, May 18th, by the time it processes at your bank, it might be May 20th or May 21st. So you'll be pretty close there, but if it's, if, like if it's the 21st and you're on May 20th, it'll be correct in your system, but it won't be that same date on your bank statement. So you always wanna put your transactions in on the date that they occurred, knowing that your bank may be a few days behind, even though it shows differently, you'll be all right on this end. 
Now, if you're putting in the date, you know, if you're putting all the transactions in at the end of the week and you put a date later than when it occurred, when you put in your statement date, you might filter those transactions out. So that's why it's meant to reflect reality. The date that it occurred is what you should put into Ledger so that your statement date contains anything before that point. I hope that makes sense. You will, as you look at a bank statement, it'll make more sense when you can't find a transaction. But as we went through this with my church and I worked with our church quite a bit on reconciling, that's one of those things that confused me. And I realized that as long as we put those dates in correctly on the transactions, and as long as we understand how the filters work, both the date selector and the reconciliation date or the statement date, then it made sense. So let's pretend this statement date is May 31st. Now any transaction before May 31st will show. The next thing we do is we put the starting and ending balance. Now, most bank statements will highlight this in the top section to say what the starting account was or starting balance of the account was and what the ending was in that time frame of the statement. But if it doesn't, you can look at the line items and the line items will look very similar to this where it'll have a running balance. Theoretically, it should be the same, but we know that nothing is ever that clean when it comes to finances. So what you want to look for is that starting balance of the bank account. What was it before any of these transactions took place? Well, in our case, it was $25,000. What was the ending balance? Well, in our case, it's $37,475. That means that there's a difference of $12,475. And that's what shows in this next section statement difference. That's the ending balance minus the starting balance. So in this case, it's a positive. Sometimes it's a negative. It doesn't matter what, whether it's positive or negative. It's just a change. That is the sum of all the transactions you're looking for. Well, then you have a selected difference. That is when you start reconciling items. And this one here says, well, how many more transactions do you need? Right now, because we haven't selected or checked off any items, it's the same as the statement difference. So we have, let's see, five transactions there. That's not many. You'll have far more on yours, I'm sure. But for demonstration purposes, it works out pretty well. What we're trying to find is $12,475 worth of transactions. And you can bet that it's going to work out to five just because of the demonstration. So as we look in here, you can see that we have every line item associated with the account that the bank would see it in that way. And the first thing I want to highlight is the transaction we just entered a few moments ago. You see here is that transaction where we paid off the house account by paying Concordia Publishing House from our checking account. We paid off the CPH house account. You'll see here that it says $250. Remember, we split it by 140 and 110, but reconciling now combines those two. It hasn't always done this. In fact, it's just been about a month that we've had this out there. So this is new functionality that is based on customer feedback saying, you know, my bank statement would show 250 here. Why are you showing 110 and 140? and they were absolutely right. We should have been showing the 250, not that split up. So this is different than it has been. It's far more accurate. It should make it easier for you to reconcile because you're looking for 250. You're not looking for 140 and 110. Now that was a common theme that we had. How do I quickly find the transactions I'm looking for? Well, let's say your statement says Concordia Publishing House $250. Well, there's a couple ways you could look for that. The first way is that you could look for $250. If you type in 250 in this filter box, which is right below your statement information, you can now filter your transactions to show the different ones that meet that criteria. You can filter by amount, memo, or payee. So this was amount. But if we know that it was Concordia Publishing House, we could type in C-O-N-C-O. -C -O. We don't even have to type in the whole amount or the whole name, and you can see there's Concordia Publishing House. Now, we that's the payee. We could also type it in by the memo, 
And so we say, oh, I remember $250. That is when we paid off. So you can say pay and it'll show based on the memo. So you can filter down by payee, by memo or amount, any one of those three. Now I only have five transactions here. It's not hard to figure that out. But when you start thinking about 40 or 50 transactions, it's very helpful to be able to filter down. Again, new functionality based on customer feedback. So if you have ideas on how to improve the software, send it to us. We can't always get to everything right away, but we do read everything. And we're always looking for ways to improve the software. All right, let's continue on. So we now know how to use the filter. And we now understand the concept of selecting the differences. As we go through here, all you have to do is either check the box or you can check any non-link part portion of the row. So you see here, these accounts are links. When you click on them, you go to a new page and I'll right click and say, open in a new window or a new tab to show this is not usually where you want to go when you are reconciled. But if you do want to go to one of these, if you want to look at the details, I recommend right clicking and saying open link in new tab so you don't lose where you're at with Reconcile. But I should tell you that you won't lose the details. There is an auto save that's included in Reconcile. Now the save button up here is actually to reconcile the transactions. We probably should rename that. That's something that we'll probably do at some point but it means to reconcile and the only way you can do that is if you're off by is zero if you've actually found all of those so we auto save it you can go back but i would want to recommend that you keep this on one screen and open this up in a new tab or a new window by right clicking on it but you can click anywhere else on the line so if i click in this blank pay spot it will go ahead and select it and i can go all the way through and these five transactions just happen to equal what I was looking for. Works out perfectly. Won't do that for you because you're going to have some checks that weren't cashed. You're going to have some transactions that were entered incorrectly. Maybe they were on a different account and you'll never have it show up, but you have it sitting there waiting for a little while. This is why it's important to reconcile all of your accounts so that you always figure out exactly what is right and what is wrong in your system. Now, when I'm ready to reconcile, all I have to do is click save and it will let me because it's off by zero. So if I click save, the line items were reconciled. And the next thing I see is that all of these transactions have a little lock icon by them that says reconciled. The um, question Noreen just put in here is, are we able to filter unreconciled transactions? Should someone hold a check for several months? Well, the first question is yes and no. No, you are not able to because we already do it. So if you go to reconcile, the only transactions that are showing are unreconciled transactions. So if you had reconciled things last month, it won't show up here. And as you can see, I didn't change my dates at all. It did default to today. But if I go back to March or May 31st, I show nothing because I have no unreconciled transactions before that date. So it already filters out reconciled transactions. Um, and so then the filters apply to only unreconciled transactions. Now Noreen said, should someone hold a check for several months? That kind of should question is one that I can't really answer. Um, should they? Well, it's a matter of personal opinion. Will they? In many cases, you will see that. So you have to be prepared for that and how you want to handle that is up to your church, whether you want to cancel checks after a number of months or follow up with people, you never know. So that is up to your church and your preferences. But those kind of checks that have not been deposited will show up here month after month. You'll have to be aware of them. And then Debbie says, if for some reason you made a journal entry incorrect, are you able to correct it when reconciling? Not from this screen, but that's where you can open things up in a new tab and edit them before reconciling. And so that's what I would recommend. Sometimes I have like a split screen reconciling on one side, my account view on the other, and so I can go look at them. The one thing you'll have to do though is refresh your reconcile screen after you make a change to a transaction. 
but because it auto saves, those check boxes and everything should stay for you. All right, those are the reconciled questions that I've seen so far. If you have more, put them into the chat, but I'm gonna continue on. The next thing I wanna show you is actually jumping ahead just a little bit. We're gonna show, now that we've reconciled that, I wanna go in here under reports and go to event log because when I go to event log, the last action I took was to reconcile seven line items. Now you'll say, well, that was five transactions. Well, that's true, but it was seven line items because some of them were with restricted funds that were combined. So in this event log, the event log shows everything that has happened. And we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail later on, but it shows everything that's happened in your account you can go click on it and generate a reconciliation report. This report actually splits up anything that you have. So here is my house account where I paid it off, paid off the CPH house account. It shows the 110 and 140 because that's what it's gonna show everywhere else. So reconciliation is the only place where you will see those combined. And that's appropriate there because that's what the bank shows. So I hope that all makes sense. You can then print this and put it with your records or you can export it to Excel or you can just say, okay, we're good. I'll leave it alone. I know how to get back to it. All right, now we're back to the account view. So if you have any more, oh, there's one more. What bank statement date should you use for prior month transactions which show on the current month bank statement? Well, you don't have to worry about that because it's gonna show everything unreconciled before that date. Now, if you have your view filter, maybe that's what you're asking actually, Jake, what date should you do here? Well, I typically recommend doing your fiscal year. Now, as you close out your fiscal year, if you have any transactions from previous the previous fiscal year, you'll see that. So you could always go back farther. This will only let you go back to the start of your account, your actual Church 360 ledger account. So you may have to enter those in you're going to have to think about that as you're starting out, but that's only going to be the first few months. So if you um, if you do have things from a previous fiscal year that were entered into Ledger, you'd have to extend your date range a little bit. But if you're having to extend your date range, that might be a way to say, well, maybe we should call those people and ask them to cash our check, or maybe we should cancel the check and say if they want it, we can issue them a new one. That way you can clear out those long-standing unreconciled transactions. And, and like I said, those happen. <laughs> I've certainly seen that at my church. You probably have seen it at your church. All right, so we've reconciled our account. That's something we do on a monthly basis. And depending on how many bank accounts you have, you might be doing it for multiple accounts. Let's go into reports next. If I go into the top right, the third icon is the reports, the middle icon, actually third from either direction. There are four primary accounts. There's the general, sorry, four primary reports. There's the general ledger report, the income and expense, the chart of accounts and the balance sheet. And then we have a secondary type of a report, which is called the event log. So the general ledger report is actually very similar to what you see on an account page. You see all of these things. It's just the listing of every single line item that has hit your account. Well, the general ledger report allows you to look at all line items and filter it down from there. So you can see here that we've got all sorts of different line items. Here you can review transactions and see what actually hit, but you can report on it by the type. So the first, or the first column is date, and it's always gonna be sorted by date. Then you can look at type, and you can see we've got check, deposit, journal entry, payment, transfer, all of those different things we did yesterday. Now it defaults to showing all, but if I unselect all and then say, well, check, here is my check ledger. Now you'll notice that we made some changes here. We had unrestricted going to, let's see what that looks like. Oh yeah, 
that's going from the unrestricted checking. We didn't make changes. It's just both sides of that transaction. Pardon me. I, I was thinking I was looking at just one side. The general ledger shows both sides of it, which is beneficial. But you can see what account it is. One is the unrestricted checking account, which is an asset. The other side is the electricity expense account. Now, as you're looking at this, it's the same transaction. This is two sides of the same line. Well, you can do it by the type, which is at a transaction level. We'll select all. You can do that by a payee, which is at the transaction level. So let's go back to Ameren Electric. When you do Ameren Electric, though, you'll see that it puts that title in there. And I accidentally clicked group. Let me ungroup it. This chain link here says group by payee. When I do that, it shows my groupings, but I only have one payee. If I did both payees, you'll see both groupings. If I do all payees, you'll see first those that don't have a payee, then those that do. Now, these, as you click on them, when you can filter, these you can actually maybe it's just sort and group. Let me go back here, select all. Yeah, it's only when you group that it comes in alphabetically. I thought that's what it was. I threw myself off by accidentally clicking on it first. Yeah, so you can filter by type, you can filter by payee. You can group by payee even if you don't filter it. But I would recommend if you're doing it by payee, you filter out the blank payees so you can only see those. Now. I will remind you, I said this briefly before, but your date selector also works on these reports. So if you just want May, you can select May, and then it'll filter down your view here, or at least it's supposed to. Yeah, there we go, just need a little refresh to take out that June transaction. So I hope that makes sense on payee. Account then becomes a similar thing. Let's ungroup this, let's select all. We have nothing filtered other than our date at this point. When we go to account, you can see that same thing. Now it alphabetizes your accounts for easy finding. That is a new change. We used to have it show by the chart of accounts, but if you didn't have a transaction on certain accounts or during that date range, it started becoming harder and harder to figure out what account was what, and so we recommended that we alphabetize it. It's easier to search, and typically you're looking for a specific account, or you're looking for one of these other filters. So that's why we made that change. Now you can also group it by account here. Equity was from our initial balances, and then you have your savings, CD, all of that. That's another way to use this general ledger report. The other thing that we've done recently, let me ungroup, and we've got it unfiltered except for the date. When you're looking at these, you may say, hey, that doesn't look quite right. Let's go to June. Here's a payment. When I click on the line, I could go and make changes to it here. You used to have to go back and find that transaction from an accounts view. You don't have to anymore. You can change it right from this report. Make your amendments like we looked yesterday. You know, if you want to change it, maybe it's 134. 134, let's just say typo on amount, click save. Now that has been corrected, although you do have to refresh to show it. So let me refresh it real quick. This shows the correction in addition to the payment as opposed to the accounts view, which combines them. So that's another difference here. This is truly the general ledger of every line item, whether it was the original transaction or the correction. Now, when you add it all together, it all works out to what's on the account view, but this breaks it down by individual transactions, including the ones we automatically generate for you. So that's the general ledger report. If you have any questions, let me know. I should highlight once again that you can export to Excel or you can print, print from your browser. 
it's designed to be viewed so the printing doesn't look fantastic but it works so if you want to print it you can the next thing we'll do is go to the income and expense account report this is a very standard type of report sometimes it's abbreviated to i and e and that can be confusing well, what's the i and e what do you mean I &E? well it's income and expense so this is ignoring your asset and liabilities accounts, ignoring anything outside of this fiscal year and saying what has occurred according to budget or compared to budget might be a better word to use there. So we have our June 2020 budget. That's because I selected the June date. If I do my entire fiscal year, it will say my entire fiscal year compared to actuals. Now, keep in mind, if you were doing this mid-year, it's gonna include all of your different budgets for future months. And it's gonna include all of your transactions, but because it's mid-year, you don't have future transactions. So it's gonna look a lot worse. That's why you typically do these things at month end, and then you set your date range to be the only timeframes that are completed. That way the budget has been completed and the actuals have. And so if we look at May 2020 budget versus May 2020 actuals, we're doing way better than we planned because I didn't plan out my budget very well. It was an example. So you have those two columns here, budget versus actual, and then percentage of budget and remaining. Now this remaining looks a little weird and it should require some explanation. This is simply math. When we say remaining, we're looking at the total budget less the actuals, which in this case becomes a negative income remaining budget. That's confusing, but it is logical. It is mathematics. So if you have any questions about that, just think back and say, okay, what's actually happening here? It's subtracting actual from budget. That's all. On the left-hand side, you have your chart of accounts for income and expense you have everything indented as it is in your hierarchy then you have these little um, arrows next to it these collapse and expand those sub accounts this provides you the opportunity to hide some things from the view so if you want more of a summary report of i and e you can do that and then you can print this out as is or if you want to display it on screen, that's what we do sometimes at our meetings at my church. We just display it on the screen. It saves paper. It allows us to show it in real time. You get all the benefits without having to print things out. So that's what those are for. And if you want to get to the nitty gritty details and just say income and expense and what's the difference, collapse it all the way down to just those two line items and you show it. Those line items are always there and they always summarize, but this makes it really clear what your totals are. All right, I hope that makes sense on I and E, the income and expense. If we go to the next report, I'm actually gonna jump down to balance sheet. And uh, Michael is asking, can you save the custom formats for reporting with a name? Michael, not at this time, it's something we're considering. These reports are pretty basic, as you've seen here, and it doesn't take long to get to it. And especially since the date is one of the main customizations, we haven't added that kind of save report view because it's just a few clicks. Um, and the date will be changing pretty much every time you look for a new report. So that's something we're considering. It's a really good suggestion. We'll put it into feedback, um, but we don't have that available right now. I'm gonna jump down to the balance sheet and show this before I get into chart of accounts. Because the balance sheet is very comparable to the statement of income and expense. Oh, um, and well, we'll talk about that in just a, a few moments. Noreen had another question, but I wanna get into balance sheet and then we'll cover that again. That'll give me a good chance to cover any other I, I, statement of income expense questions. The balance sheet works in the same way as the other report, except instead of income and expense, it is looking at your assets and liabilities. This does not change with your fiscal year. This does not get cleared out. It just continually adds and subtracts to the totals. This is what you should be able to validate with your bank statements. So you'll see there's assets. We've got our bank category, our American bank category, our individual accounts. 
we don't get down into the level of restricted accounts here. This is just at the actual account level. And then we also have our liabilities. What this shows is your starting balance at the beginning of the time period, so in this case May 1st, and your ending balance as of the end of the time period, in this case May 31st. Then it says debits and credits and the change, the overall change. So this first one, our assets went from 350,000 even to 359. And so our change, 9,475, is what's here. And you can see that all the way down each of those next rows. Even though they don't all add up to it, we haven't changed our investments at all. Then you get the change percentage, and that is compared to the starting balance. You have the same functionality where you can collapse and expand groups. So if I want to just see my assets and liabilities, I collapse them down to there, and you can see then I also have my total. Now we don't put debits and credits under the assets less liabilities because this is math based on these. So that doesn't really serve any purpose, but you can see the overall change. And so because like here, 947 minus liabilities, when you minus or subtract a negative, it becomes a positive, you add it. That's why this goes up to 9,585. So this view is a little bit different than income and expense, but it's that same thing where you're looking at two primary account types. Now, if we go back up one to chart of accounts, the headers are the same. You have the starting balance, ending balance, debits, credits, change, change percentage. All of that's the same. But now, not only do you have all four account types, assets, liabilities, income and expense, you also have your restricted funds in here. There's VBS, unrestricted. So it really creates a very clear picture of where you stand today. That ending balance is the end of the time frame. If you do it year to date, you will always see where you're at today. Everything else on here is the same. The headers are the same, the management of them. The income and expense is a little bit different than on the other report because you have starting and ending balance as opposed to budget versus actual. So that's where the chart of accounts reports come in. Let's jump back to statement of I and E because we're contrasting them right now. And I can answer Noreen's question. It says, is the remainder of the I and E for the year or the month? It is the remainder based on that time frame you set in the date selector. So in this case, it's the remainder in May. But if you put it for your entire fiscal year, it's the remainder for the entire fiscal year. If you do it year to date, that's what you have across those months, the remainder for your time selected date range. That's the real difference. I hope that helps. Next, we're gonna go to the event log. So that is under reports. The very bottom is event log. So the event log, I, I previewed this a few moments ago. This is the log of all the activities that occur in your account. This goes back to the very first day when we talked about security. We can't stop somebody from doing something wrong, but we can bring light to it by tracking every individual thing. Now, what we've done since reconciliation, reconciliation was the second line here. The only thing we did was we entered a new transaction that was a revision of another transaction. We edited a transaction. But you'll see here that they have internal IDs that we display and links. So a few moments ago, I created a new transaction. I'll click on that, which is an adjustment transaction for $2 but it's just that adjustment. And then here, a revision of this transaction, and we have that showing the original amount. Well, actually, that gets down to not the original amount. It shows the final amount, but it indicates that it has changed prior amendments. We can still change it again if we wanted to because it hasn't been reconciled. So it shows any transactional kind of activity. It shows updates to payees. It shows 
anything that you want to address or adjust on here. We destroyed a payee before, that was during my prep. Here's a number of new transactions. I created a new account. See, there's some more new accounts. All of those things are put in here. You can filter the list by the action type, created, destroyed, finalized, printed, updated. You can do it by the type, account, payee, reconciliation, transaction. If I don't want to find all your reconciliations, you can do that. You can do it by user. So if you have somebody that you want to check in on, you can filter it down by just their actions. Now, this is also why it's so important to have individual users and uh, roles set up. So that way you can get down to it. If you all share a login, you'll never know who did what. So I encourage you to create logins for every individual person. Anytime you see this kind of tail or teal type, you are able to click on that link. So like here, reconciled seven items, you're able to click on that and go to the details. In and of itself, reconciled lines, seven line items doesn't mean too much, but clicking on it, seeing those details, get you exactly what you need. All right, that is the event log. And of course you can export to Excel or print and it is also tied to the date range. So if I wanted to just show May, gotta be careful not to forget anything. Well, I'll tell you, I'm actually done with our outline. I don't think I have anything else more to do. So I'm gonna review this carefully. We covered the date selector. We reconciled an asset account. And we went through the five different reports, general ledger, income and expense, chart of accounts, balance sheet, and event log. Now, since we have a few more minutes, I'm gonna go ahead um, and cover something that I glossed over yesterday in way too much detail. We created payees yesterday. We created Concordia Publishing House and I am UE, but I didn't show you how to manage them like I promised. That's something I saw as I was going through the, getting ready for today. I was like, how did I forget that? Well, it's because it's so simple. Under settings, down at the very bottom, this is an account, not a book settings. You have payees. That means your payees can be shared across different books. Well, the reason for that is we don't track a lot about payees, so the information is probably consistent. So you can add a payee from a transaction. They will show up here. When you go here, you can click on a payee and it gives you a few details. You can put a first and last name, a company name, street address, and then notes. That's about it. So if we look at Concordia Publishing House, you can see there's our company name, address, city, state, zip, phone number, and then terms are 30 days. That's all we track on them. Now, if you need to provide details for a pay, you can go hover over it and click history. And this gets you what we call a payee profile view. This shows all of the individual line items. It doesn't give you a lot of details. It gives you the account name and whether it was credits or debits or both. Um, it's not, in, sorry, I shouldn't say line items. Individual accounts and the summary of those transactions. So it's not an individual line item per company or per payee. And that's because you can get that under the general ledger. So if I wanted to go see everything that Concordia Publishing House had, I just go in here, filter it down by payee. So it's not a lot. I'm, that's why I often forget to cover over because payees are so simple. And if you go over to the far right, you can see a delete button or deactivate. You can only delete payees that have no transactions with them. Both of these do, so they can be deactivated. All right, the, oh, we've got a good question here. Um, for payroll, does the payee tie into 360 members so you don't have to type in the address? That's a good question, Debbie, it does not. Um, and payroll is something I should have mentioned um, but I didn't go into it in great detail because we only offer payroll through paychecks, or at least an integration. Under um, settings, we have imported transactions. Payroll comes in here. Well, because we integrate with paychecks, 
And because we use data from there, and I'm not going to get into it today because it's more customized training. Um, working with Paychex has been great, but you really need to have those individual conversations. With Paychex, we link with their information, and so we don't have that payee link to members. But it's a good idea and something we'll put into for future suggestions. All right, um, we've got a few more questions coming in. I'm going to go back to here and move forward. I'm going to talk about our training resources one last time, and then I'll get on to our question and answers, and anything is game. You can ask any question about Church 360 Ledger, and I'll do my best to answer it. So under training resources, you can go to 360ledger.com slash training and find how you can purchase a manual or uh, sign up for future webinars. You can follow our product update blog. Some of those things I mentioned today, we just released on our blog a few weeks ago. And then you can go to our resource center, which is where we put all this stuff under Church 360 Ledger. You just go to resources.concordiatechnology.org, click software, Church 360 Ledger, and you'll see all those options. From a support standpoint, if you have questions after today's webinar, you can reach out to our support team by accessing the online help center. This is pretty much everything that's in the training manual. It's just digital and searchable. That's one of the reasons why we charge for the training manual because it's all about the printing costs. We don't have that many people that are interested in it. And the information is available in the online help center. So we make it available to you for free. We just charge you for the physical distribution of it through the training manual. The support email address is support at cts.cph.org. If you're in the online help center, you can submit a request there. You can also submit it from in the application using the little information center in the lower right hand corner. And our phone number is listed there too, 800-346-6120. If you call them up, you may talk to Jordan, who's been answering questions. You may talk to any one of our other team members who are all excellent. They are all located here in St. Louis. Normally I'd say in our building, but I think some of them are still working from home right now. We are open Monday through Friday, 7.30 to 5, and you don't have to just have a problem to call support. You can call support with questions, for training questions, anything like that. Reach out to them for any help. In terms of our question and answers for today, please type your questions in the GoToWebinar chat. I know many of you have already been utilizing that. If you don't know how to do it, look in your GoToWebinar panel for the place that says questions and type it in there. Remember, a recording will be emailed within 48 hours, probably even less. Early tomorrow morning is my goal. So you don't have to ask about that. If you are watching the recording, please send questions to support at cts.cph.org. If you want to know where to find the recording, and this is going to be out there for a long time, you can go to resources.concordiatechnology.org. When you get here, go to software, go down to Church 360 Ledger. You can see the first one there is session two from yesterday. Now, after I upload today's, I'm actually going to rearrange them so that it'll be one, two, three, but it'll be up there for you. All right, let me go back here and jump into my questions. I think I answered a lot of them, but I want to start at the beginning. So we talked about how to filter out unreconciled transactions. Those are already filtered out. In fact, I want to go ahead and move these over here so I can look at the camera and talk to the questions pretty easily. Oops. Um, we talked about you can edit a journal entry or any sort of transaction when you're reconciling, but I recommend doing it in another tab, another window, and then refreshing. Talked about those. Okay, next one. Noreen is saying, can we scan docs, invoices, or statements to store with the transaction? Well, not right now, but that is something we've heard. That's something we've talked about. We're trying to figure out the best way to do that, um, and it's probably going to be a little while before we introduce that. There's a lot of different complications with that. Um, one of them, and I'll just share because you might have feedback on that. Typically, now in software, when you have a connection to documents, you would have the ability to connect it to like Google Drive or OneDrive or Box or any one of these other file storage 
Um, I don't know if that is what people want though when they're talking about financial documents. They may want to have it directly uploaded to Ledger. So if you have an opinion on that, let us know. Are you wanting to do it from some other file sharing software or do you want to have it stored securely in Ledger and only in Ledger? That's some things we, we've wrestled with. And again, we always try to prioritize our development on what is going to benefit the most number of customers. And so some of these things fall farther down the list. But the more information we have, the more people we have asking for it, the more likely it is that it'll show up near the top of our development priorities. On reconciling, I've reconciled January and marked items off. When I go back to it, then the items are no longer saved. I thought you had said that the items would be saved automatically. Yes, Terry, that is correct. They are saved automatically, but I've noticed that before too when I do it, and we've tried to track it down. Typically what we found, I've never been able to reproduce it when I've tried, and so what I usually chalk it up to is that I've accidentally clicked cancel. So let me, oops. Yeah, we'll go here, reconcile. So what you're saying is you go through this process, you enter things, you check it off or check one of them, go back to find something else, it's not saved. Well, it's supposed to save every time you check the box. I, like I said, I've experienced that too. It's possible that you clicked cancel and that cleared out everything. So that when you go back to reconcile, it's like this. Now, if you type in something and you click 10,000 and you click checkbox and then you go back, you don't do anything, that may not have been enough time for it to save to the server. But you see here, I went back to it, it's there. That's how it's supposed to operate. So I don't want to say that it's user error because I've experienced that too, in which case then it would be my user error as well but I can say that we have seen it and not been able to successfully reproduce it. And so the only thing we can point back to is accidentally hitting cancel. I know that's not a great answer and I don't completely buy that, but until I can reproduce it, you know, and, and I've gone to the development team before and they're like, all right, what steps did you take? Show me it. I can never show it to them again. So I don't want you to lose any confidence in there. I just want you to know that I empathize with you and I'm, guessing that I have accidentally clicked cancel because it's a natural instinct to say, all right, well, let me go back a second and we probably could figure out a better way to make that clear in the user interface. But that's why I suggest leaving this open and going and opening like a new tab when you go to change things. So using, you know, like I use Windows 10, I do a split screen like this. Usually I have it zoomed out more so it's not as bad but then you can make your transaction edits over here and then refresh. That's how I do it, but I, I absolutely believe you that it has happened to you before because it has happened to me. I just can't find it. And our team has tested it thoroughly as well. So I know that's not a great answer, but um, that's the best that I can give you. Let's see, what else? Marsha is saying, I'd like to update my reconciliation. This hasn't been done for over three years and doesn't reflect the true checking balance. Can I wipe this out and start over? Probably not. How can I update this? Or do I just need to go forward with check balance that is with a check balance that is not correct? All right. Well, Jordan's recommending you call the support line, and I think that's absolutely good, but I can comment on that a little bit. You still should call the support line because there might be unique situations in there. But when we first started with Church 360 Ledger, our old system hadn't been properly reconciled in a while. And so we went through this decision process of, well, do we reconcile there or do we reconcile it once we get into Ledger? Well, what we did is we basically took the beginning balances of all of our restricted funds and put them in there, but put our bank account at what the bank account actually showed and started reconciling from that point. And we would find some mistakes and we adjusted the beginning balance before we cleaned up our first reconciliation. But at that point, then we had a good starting point after our first month. And so we've been able to keep it going from there. That's what I would recommend, is get to a good actual point, 
write everything off as a correction, a journal entry that corrects it. Or uh, if you have reconciled, you can't change your beginning balances. So that's where you do a journal entry to say corrections. But then at least from that point forward, you're in a better shape. So that's my recommendation. But as you talk to the support team, they may be able to recommend something even better than that. Let's see. Um, do you mean the orange button with the dollar sign? If so, I wouldn't hear it. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, let's see. Yeah, so Terry, going back to your reconciling question, let me go ahead and I'll check, change some things here. The orange button should not be cancel. That'll take you back to the home screen. When you go to assets, banks, American savings, reconcile, it stays there for me. It's only this cancel button on the right hand that's supposed to clear it. So that's, um, again, the other, like I mentioned before, there's sometimes I've wondered if maybe I've lost my internet connection and then those didn't save. That could do it, but most people are on a hard line when they're doing, um, when they're doing ledger. You know, it's not like you're doing it from your phone. All right, continuing on. Did you cover budgeting in the first or second session? If not, could you talk about that? And can you print out a budget report for the upcoming year? We did talk about that in the first section. I can show you something rather quickly. If you go to here to settings and you go to budgets, and you're beginning to budget for the next year, you can export to Excel. So if you're looking ahead, let's go here to fiscal years. Yeah, I did something weird with my fiscal year here. I gotta look at that. Oh, I haven't had the support team dig into it for me but I, I did something wrong, so it's not letting me go ahead. My other account lets me go ahead. So there's something with this data that I changed, but you can go to the next year. So when, like right now I'm in the current fiscal year, um, you should be able to go ahead and export out whatever you see in this view. And you can export to Excel and you can manage it there. That's where you have the next year's report, essentially. You could also change your date range and go to your you know, income and expense report, look ahead to the following year. You know, if we said 2021 to 2022, but we don't have anything in there right now. You would never have actuals, of course, in the future, but you could look at it in this way, export it to Excel. So that's another way of doing it. All right, let's see, what else? So Terry's going back to reconciliation. Also, the items that do not clear in the current statement. For example, the items still outstanding for January. When I go to February balance, I go back to January to mark them off. When I do that, then I show that I am off by that amount for the February statement. What am I doing wrong? Well, that's probably your date range. If the bank processed the transactions during February, then it should work out well with your statement balance. If they didn't, then it means that you should have checked them off in January. I think calling into support, kind of walking through those specific questions will be the best case scenario because there's, you know, some of these get into really specifics that are unique to your church. We can talk about how the software should respond, but your bank statement may say something different or may be confusing or may point to a different transaction. Same information, you know, if you have regular bills, it can be confusing whether you checked off the one from January or the February because it was the same payee, it was the same amount. So there's probably more in there. All right, there's a few more questions from Terry related to that. So I'm not gonna go into more detail because I think that's best for support. And I think that's all the questions I have for today. I moved it out of the way so I could see, let me put it back here so you're not seeing me turning my neck around. Yeah, I think we're in good shape. So Terry, I recommend you call on support. I will put up that support number one more time. There you go. And that's good for everybody. If you have any questions at all, let me know. I think I covered everything I intended to cover today and during the course. If there's anything I missed that you have questions about, please reach out to our support team or you can reach out to me, although you'll probably get a quicker response from our support team because I spent a lot of time leading webinars. 
So reach out to them with your questions. And um, if you have any feedback for our webinars, always let me know. I really appreciate you being here these last three days. And remember, you can watch these again in our resource center. Thanks so much for attending. I hope you have a great rest of the day. We'll see you next time.